Our speaker today is Professor uh, Peter Huntoon, who's retired from the University of Wyoming. He's a hydrologist, uh, that's a geologist who studies water with the, um, <clears throat> and got his degrees from the University of Arizona, which is one of the most prestigious hydrology, hydrogeology programs in the country. He's worked on a number of problems other than um, hydrogeology, including meteorite impact dynamics and uh, Grand Canyon geology. He's gotten a number of awards uh, and citations as best speaker, best teacher at the University of Wyoming. He's a fellow of the Geological Society of America, and he's going to talk to us today about the deforestation of the karst country in China under Chairman Mao. Welcome. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> if we could have the lights, I'll get right into this. The story I'm about to tell you is a rather incredible story that I simply stumbled upon. I didn't know about this going in at all. I had the opportunity to go to China in 1988 to a conference, and I was invited to uh, participate in a little group that would uh, consider exchange uh, uh, prospects by a, a Chinese scientist named Ru Jinwen, and I went to it. And this is simply a case of saying yes when something neat comes along. He was trying to develop some exchange programs, and uh, I said yes. Nobody else said yes. So two years later, I went over there at the invitation of their, uh, uh, their version of the National Science Foundation, and I worked for about uh, three months. And as I started to work, I started to see the problem that I'm going to show you. Now what happened is uh, this talk is Chairman Mao, the Great Leap Forward, and the deforestation ecological disaster in the South China karst. For those of you that aren't uh, real familiar with the jargon, karst is uh, highly dissolved limestone terrain. What we're talking about is an old mountain belt that had thousands of feet of uh, limestones in it, just about nothing else. And this was dissolved over the eons, and it left us with this fantastic exotic uh, topography that I'm going to show you. And uh, so I went over here to see this almost more as a tourist than a scientist. But once I got an opportunity to go back and study, I couldn't resist, so I went back. And then this story started to unfold, which is totally out of my line. The area that I went to are the three Chinese provinces directly above uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Guangxi, Guizhou, and Yunnan province over there. This is a geologic map of China, and you can see, uh, let's see if I can focus that for you. You can see that there's uh, very dominant blue patterns. Those blue patterns are the areas where these limestones crop out that I'm interested in. So down there, uh, going through South China and down into uh, uh, Vietnam and Cambodia are these fantastic limestones, and these things give rise to uh, exotic scenery like that that you see. This is taken near Guilin. The way to think of this stuff is, is that this is really the analog is, if you ever remember from your um, grammar school days, when they would show you a tooth and they would drip sugar water on it and it would start to dissolve. Do you all remember that one? Well, anyway, that's one that I saw. That's exactly what you're looking at. These are dissolved forms that you're seeing. They're very exotic. When they came along, when people first started to see images of this stuff, it arrived in England on plates that were shipped out of China during the 16 and 1700s, and people thought it was all fantasy stuff until they started to go there and actually saw scenery that looked like this. Very exotic stuff. I'll just take you on a little scenic tour of it. It's caused by dissolution of limestone. You can see a beautiful natural bridge, which is a remnant of a cave. And if you look here, you'll see there's a stream heading right into the mountain. And right behind the uh, 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 lower left corner is a huge cave. And the stream just goes right through the mountain. So what we're looking at is very interesting groundwater geology. This is a typical community out in the middle of this area. This uh, three province area that I'm talking about is almost the size of Colorado, Wyoming, and uh, Utah combined. So it's a substantial surface area. It's a populated wilderness. There's about 100 to 150 million people that live out there. What I'm going to do is take you out. We started at a village, and we're just going to go progressively further out into the boondocks. And I think what you'll see is that the scenery remains very much the same 
like that. Finally, you run out of road, and the last thing you have is trail, and you start taking the trail out as far as you can. And you finally get out to near the end of the trail, and it all looks the same. About the time I woke up, I was looking at the scenery, and uh, I realized during the wet season, which lasts half the year, they get between three and six feet of rain a year. And I started asking a question, if they get that much rain, where are the trees? I haven't seen a tree. Here's very typical scenery. The clouds are coming in, it's going to start raining. And there isn't a tree out there. And what they told me was that the trees were cut down during the Great Leap Forward campaign in 1958 through 1963. Uh, and uh, the most of the cutting occurred the first year. One thing that troubled me as I looked at this, that story sounded incredible. Because if you look at that, the question is, where are the stumps? You see any stumps? I never saw any. And uh, so I inquired about that. And then I really got my eyes open. What happened was, <clears throat> Mao was trying in the Great Leap Forward campaign to put a modern infrastructure in China. The primary thing that he wanted to do was build a, a, a national railway system. And they built a superb railway system. In order to build the railway system, they needed concrete, cement, and uh, steel in vast quantities. And they needed something to fuel those uh, two commodities. And what Mao did is, uh, he came from South China. He lived in this country. He didn't think that much of it. And when they asked him where they should get the fuel to fuel the smelting and the, um, the kilns for the limestone, he waved his hand across South China and just basically said, well, you might as well cut down those worthless trees down there. They're not worth anything. So what they did is they turned tens of thousands of peasants off their communal farms out into the forests these guys cut down the trees, they took them back, they turned the trees into charcoal, and then they used that charcoal to, lo uh, to fire local uh, iron ore smelling kilns and also lime kilns so that they could produce lime from the limestone. And uh, it took them about two years for the uh, tens of thousands of peasants that were involved to cut all the trees from this three province area plus some additional areas and finish the job. When they got done, they still hadn't met their quotas. So beginning about 1959 to 1960, they sent them back out and those guys hand dug up every single stump and turn that into charcoal. Now that sounds rather incredible. If you've ever type, tried to pull a stump out of the ground, you've got to understand that these people were driven. I didn't believe it until they saw that they still do it. Here comes truckloads of second growth stumps out of the same area that they've dug up because wood is so valuable a commodity in here, they can't afford to leave it in the ground. So even now, when they cut down a tree, somebody goes out there and digs them up, and here comes a bunch of stumps coming in to be used as a heating fuel. <clears throat> OK, when you found a tree, and I did this unconsciously because I didn't know the story yet, it was such a phenomenal sight that you took a picture of it. And that's why I got this particular picture. It was the only tree I'd seen for a couple of weeks. And it was kind of a scenic place. And somehow that got left. OK, the assault on the forest occurred in three stages. The worst and heaviest was the Great Leap Forward. Virtually this area was cut off in two years, 1959 and 1958 and 1959. And then, uh, then what happened was the um, the people went back to their communes and tried to reestablish their agricultural lives. The next thing that happened in China was the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And this lasted for about 10 years. And this is where they tried to purge the last of the capitalistic feelings that might linger in the entire country. They got rid of their intelligentsia, and they turned the country over to the peasants. And uh, basically, anarchy prevailed. The culture, there are two Chinas. 
there's a pre-cultural revolution China and there's a post-cultural revolutionary China and that period served as a filter for knowledge. If you had books and you were educated, you were at great risk. And uh, what happened, I talked to my academic colleagues, those that did survive, what they said they did was take their books and turn them into the paper drive and got them out of the house so they wouldn't be killed for having that kind of knowledge around. And they tried to fade into the country and be as invisible as possible until this thing uh, stopped. After the Cultural Revolution, the country started to revive and uh, the, the culture, the rich culture of China had to be retaught to its citizens. When we started to get Chinese students at the University of Wyoming after the Cultural Revolution, their job was to come over here and photocopy the journals and take them back so that they could recover the literature that they'd lost. I'm sure you experienced that on this campus too. But anyway, that happened in uh, 66 to 76. Anarchy prevailed. The lid was off the peasants, and the peasants had been looking at the forest for years as a source of wealth and without any government control. They just went out there and cut what was left from the uh, uh, Great Leap Forward. Then in 1979, they broke up the communes because agriculture was failing in China, particularly in South China, and they thought, well, they better let the people out to do their own thing. And when they broke up the communes, the peasants dispersed from these small communities and spread out into the wilderness. And if there was a tree left, they cut it down and used it to build whatever house they could. So by the end of 1979, there was virtually nothing left. Okay, now that I've mentioned Mao, uh, here's a picture of Mao when he was young. The idea here is, is that um, we like to think that we can do some good in these universities. We teach people how to do things, sustainability, all those kind of concepts. If you get an autocrat like this who has genuine power, they have the uh, power at the flick of a wrist to undo everything that you can imagine. And so the, the uh, tribulations I'm about to show you can be laid directly at his feet. He waved his arms, the job was done. That was all there was to it. Okay, now this is a classic picture looking down through the uh, karst hills of South China. You can see for as far as uh, you like that they are totally denuded. The only thing that's on them is some green brush. And uh, I was able to uh, climb this one peak one day and turned around 90 degrees and I got this picture which gives you the beautiful contrast. There's a village with the forest preserved behind a village. And that's what the whole thing used to look like. It was a subtropical rainforest. What happened in this particular case is the village chief had so much political power, he was able to preserve the woods behind his house. So we get this remarkable photograph. All right, there's another one that I caught, the lone tree out in the middle of nowhere. Somebody left that tree at the top of the hill as a cynical reminder of what used to be down here. After the campaign was completed, some of the Chinese actually renamed their villages because they no longer looked like Shady Glen. Now they could call them the Sunspot or whatever. Okay, there were obvious ecological results, as you might expect. Bird populations were decimated, species disappeared. Uh, their big game species disappeared, including tigers. They had lots of tigers down here. They're gone. And then one of the worst things that happened was is they had all this open ground, and the peasants began to plant inappropriate uh, crops on the uh, poor ground. Here's a, here's a photograph of a cornfield. And it's not the flat thing in the foreground. It's that rocky slope. That's the cornfield. Here you see somebody standing there, and you see the corn stalks in the little pockets of soil between the little limestone pillars. That's where they're growing corn. Well, all of you from the Midwest know the problem with that. Corn is a very poor crop for retaining soil. So when the rain hits this, the soil simply erodes. And uh, this was a major ecological event, is massive soil erosion. OK, the primary hydrologic impacts of this were that uh, this area actually underwent climatic modification. 
they have an annual wet and dry cycle, and the uh, flood drought cycle was greatly exacerbated. I'll point some of that out to you in a little uh, uh, bit. The area was so extensively cut that it started to undergo desertification. Let me give you a, an idea how this works. Prior to the cutting of the forest, if you walk through the woods, maximum summer, uh, uh, summer temperatures would range around 80 to 90 degrees. It would be comfortable but very humid. Uh, I actually like that type of climate. After they cut the forest and a canopy was gone, then you had the sun beating down directly on the ground, and now it's not uncommon to reach summer high temperatures 120 degrees, uh, 30 or 40 degrees more than what was normal. They had severe soil erosion, which you might uh, um, expect, and they lost what they call their green reservoir. Their green reservoir was their forest and their trees, and we'll talk about that a little bit as we get in here, because that's a, a term that I learned and is very valuable over there. What you're looking at here is uh, a typical uh, a uh, flat valley that lies between these stone hills. And you can see that it's a bunch of abandoned fields. You can see some of the abandoned tillage down on the lower corner. Any flat area in China is farmed. There isn't a square inch of it that's not, unless there's a good reason for it. Now, the reason that this place is not farmed now, and we're looking at a couple of square miles in that picture, is that this place experiences severe flooding during the uh, wet season, and then parched dry conditions during the dry season. Because the water that landed on the hills just runs directly off instead of going into storage within the uh, forest. A forest has an amazing ability to retain water. Uh, when the rain is falling, a lot of water gets caught by the leaves. Most of it gets to the ground and it seeps into the organic mat that's, that the forest is growing on. And then it is gradually released through the root systems and through the organic mat. It's either taken up by the roots or it gradually flows off these hills. Well, without the trees, the water hits the hills and it comes down. So the area that we're looking at here during the uh, wet season will have flash floods that are as much as 20 feet deep. That wipes out their whole uh, wet season crop. And then when the uh, dry season comes along, uh, it's so dry, there's no uh, retained water being leaked into this like in the old days from the sides, and so they can't get a crop off the dry ground, so it's been abandoned. Uh, soil erosion obviously is a major factor. You're just looking at one of millions of gullies that's eroding and dumping the soil. They don't call the Yellow River yellow for nothing. For groundwater, which was the thing I was interested in, we have uh, major impacts. The high-level springs, any spring that came out of the sides of those little pinnacles have just totally dried up because there's no storage of water to leak it into the limestone to allow it to seep down to the springs anymore. The large springs that are, occur out in the flat areas where the water table is pretty high they become very unreliable because during a dry season, the water levels drop sufficiently that they can't get to it anymore. So the uh, problem is, is that we have an exacerbated hydrologic cycle. And the nightmare for the local population is, is that they rely on this stuff 12 months of the year. And they have about two or three months at the end of the dry season when conditions get so dry, there's not enough water around for them to make it that last two months until it starts raining again. Here's a typical picture looking at a low area, and you can see there's water ponded on the surface there. What you're looking at here is the top of the aquifer. That's, uh, that's actually the uh, elevation of the water table out here in these lowlands. And during the dry season, those little ponds just started to disappear as the water levels drop. In the old days, these ponds used to be there 365 days a year. Now they're not there for as much as uh, 60 or 80 days of the year. And that's made a major impact on these people. Here's a house that's located right at the foot of the spires. And it's located there along with a couple of others because 
they piped water in from seeps. So they located their houses next to the water supply, just like you would, except now the uh, water supply is gone and those houses have no water. The result is, is that the women had to take a couple of buckets, like you see there, walk five kilometers in this particular case down to a sinkhole that goes down to the water level underneath the plains that surround this area, dip those two buckets in and carry those back to the house. She's carrying something on the order of 50, 60 pounds of water and she'll make two or three trips a day doing that every single day of her life. The lot of women in China, in South China, is to move water. That's the best use we can find for them. Okay, the removal of the canopy means that temperatures on a land surface rose. I mentioned that. They went from the 80s to the 100s. The humidity drops like a rock, and the wind velocities increase, just as you might expect. The worst thing that happens for the story is, is the organic mat that's growing on top of the clay soils that they have down there simply oxidizes and disappears after a couple of years. Uh, this is the uh, humus and the mosses and the ferns and all that kind of stuff. As soon as the sun hits that, it desiccates it, and then that stuff oxidizes, and it literally goes up as CO2 and there's nothing left of it. So, the soil desiccation is the major uh, problem that we have after this process has gone on for a couple of years. Uh, when we take a look at the soils that occur under these karst areas, what you're looking at is what we call the dissolution residuals from limestone. These are the impurities that are in the limestone and 98% of the rock dissolves away and 2% is left as these uh, fine clays. They form a very dense clay, and uh, so the soils are extremely clay rich, but they, the soils themselves are nutrient poor because of the vast amount of rain that hits them. All the nutrients have long ago been leached out. So the, uh, the, what we find is the minerals are leached out of the soils and they're organic poor. There's very little uh, organic matter left. These two factors go into, uh, be a curse if you want to try to get something growing there again. What you're looking at here is a young woman working in a brickyard, and what she's done is she's simply uh, taken soil that's been cut up, I mean, that's been, uh, that been dug up, and they've uh, put a little water with it, and she's cut them into bricks, and they're getting ready to fire these things. <laughs> this is the type of soils that we're talking about, the mineral poor, organic poor soils. These soils are so organic poor, in order to fire those bricks, they have to put in powdered coal to get the organic content up so that they can fire them into bricks. Here's a field, and this is a corn field. This actually is an active corn field. It doesn't look that good. It looks like your worst imagination of a drought here in the Midwest. What you're looking at are typical soils that have lost the organic mat on the top of them. They have no nutrients, so the plants don't like it very much. And the sun has been on it for a couple of years. And what it's done, it's baked that clay soil into something that has the consistency of a low-fired adobe brick. And now if you want to go back in and restore, this is the starting point for what you want to start with. The solution, of course, is to replant the green reservoir, get trees back out there. And they knew this in the uh, early 1960s, and the first reforestation efforts they did is they flew over the place and threw uh, seeds out of the plain. And some of this led to some trees. But that wasn't particularly successful. The way you do it is to hand plant trees. What you're looking at here is a um, restored or a refurbished uh, hillside where the peasants have gone out there in some project and simply hand planted trees and they keep the rest of the peasants off of there so they don't cut them and maybe that'll grow up into a forest if they have good luck. The forest regeneration is really difficult because the organic mat is lost and the soils are desiccated. Here's a modern reforestation effort. What they've done in this case, I think you can see this rather clearly, is they simply torched a scrubby brush that grew on the side of the hill, burned it off, then 
they had school children come out there and dig all those holes and hand plant a tree in each one of them, and hopefully it'll come, come in. Here is a planted forest that's about 30 or 40 years old when I took the picture. One of the things that you notice is, is that most of these forests are absolute monocultures. There's only one kind of tree going back in instead of the great diversity that was originally here. And you also notice that these planted forests are on the low soily areas, whereas the high rocky peaks that used to be covered with forests are still bare. Okay, this happens to be four trees that the Chinese loved. Uh, their idea of a great tree is one that grows very fast and it has to have one other attribute. If somebody comes in there and chops it off, it'll re-sprout from the stump. Here you see one of the planted forests. This happens to be a pine forest that was uh, replanted by seeding from the air early on. And uh, this woman is walking through it. It's a monoculture of these pine trees that goes for several miles. There isn't a, a single uh, bit of uh, biodiversity in there. At least they got something growing. But all of you that work in the agricultural Midwest realize that something like this is very vulnerable. If you get one uh, bug that goes after this kind of tree, you're going to lose the whole forest, not just the species out of the forest. Here you see eucalyptus trees. They love them because they're very fast growing and they, uh, they uh, uh, are good hardwood. They make good firewood. And that's a, a, a nice grove of, uh, of eucalyptus that have been hand planted. And if you get in there, they're all in nice, neat lines. Here you see bamboo. Bamboo is a particularly valuable wood crop in China. And uh, bamboo comes back in where you have springs. And this is a seep area. And here's this beautiful bamboo uh, forest uh, coming back up. That's a very valuable clump of little uh, trees. This is, uh, this is the Chinese concept of biodiversity. What you're looking at is hardwoods to the left and pine trees to the right where these two different projects abut each other. Look at the condition of those soils in the foreground. There's nothing there. There's dirt, but no, nothing to grow on. Here's the perfect tree. Notice that somebody's come in and cut all the trees down that were about four or five inches of diameter, and the stumps have re-sprouted, and now you've got multiple shoots coming up. They're very happy to have this type of species because at least it comes back without anybody going out there and having to tend it. Okay. <clears throat> We're standing on the edge of that pine forest where I, I, I just showed you the woman walking through. And you can see there's some pine trees off to the side. We're standing at the edge of the forest looking out into the vast country that's left that they simply haven't been able to get to. In other words, the reforestation effort is underway. It's been underway for decades, but they have just barely scratched the surface of what really needs to be done. Most of the country is still as bare as those uh, bare hills behind you, and they're going to stay bare. OK, the problem in China, and in South China in particular, is, of course, the same problem as the world. What you see everywhere you go are hordes of kids. The median age in China is 24 years old. What that means is that the population of China will double in the next 20 years. In 20 years, by 2020, the population of China is going to be 5 billion people. The population of the Earth today is just over 5 billion people. Those are startling figures. But realize that in 2020, the population of India will have passed China. And Indonesia is right up there behind them. So between those three countries alone, we're looking at a population that can't be less than 10 million people, and it's going to be trying to push 15 million. And that's just 20 to 30 years away. Here's something to think of ecologically. This happens to be the bicycle parking lot in a small town. Now, let me pose an interesting question for you. I park my bike in there. How do I find it? This is tough. <laughs> but anyway, what I want you to do is imagine every one of those bicycles being converted into a Toyota uh, Tricel. That's the way the country is going now. These people are coming up. 
They're like we were in the 30s. They all have aspirations to join something equivalent to the American middle class, and they are working hard to get there right now, and these bicycles are being converted into cars now, and you can't believe the traffic, and of course you can't believe the pollution that they're creating. Here's a wonderful prosaic picture. I just took it. It was a scenic picture. I wasn't thinking about anything when I did it other than getting that nice shot. But I caught in the bottom there, you see that guy pushing that wagon and somebody's pulling it? Here are two locals who have gone out to cut the fuel that they're going to use for the next winter. This is in South China. It's against the law to use fuel for space heating. You just get a bigger coat. What you use the fuel for is to fire your stove. In the old days, they'd go out and cut a load of wood, and it would come in and be fine. Now what they have to do is go out into the hills and capture whatever they can off those hills, and mostly what they're getting are straws and grasses. Here's a couple that are coming in with their child. They're sitting on top of their fuel. They're going to their home, and they're taking this in to uh, a stack with the rest of the stuff they're going to use for the rest of the winter. You got to ask yourself, how many loads of that stuff are you going to have to shove through your stove just to cook next winter? You have to boil every single drop of water you drink in South China or you're going to kill yourself. So they use a lot of uh, fuel. This, is, uh, this South China area is, uh, is based on a wood economy, not on diesel fuel or electricity or, or uh, uh, coal. Here's a woman coming out of that eucalyptus drove I just showed you. And look at the prize that she's got. She's collecting wood. She can't cut the forest. That's against the law. But notice that she's gone out there. And what she does is she goes out there every day and rakes the stuff that's fallen off the trees. And today, she's got some real prizes. If you look off there on the left, there's a couple of sticks that are about 3 quarters of an inch to an inch in diameter. She is really scored. Here, every day, armies of women go out into the karst hills and they cut whatever they can find. And what you're looking at is individuals streaming back out of the hills to go back to their village at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And they've collected these bundles of uh, uh, scruffy brush and they're taking them back to fuel their winters. Happens all summer long. Day after day, this procession goes through this place, and they have to literally mow over all those barren hills every year just to make a subsistence living today. So the idea of forest regeneration is thwarted by having to go out and cut whatever is growing as fast as it comes up. It's a very sobering story. What you're looking at here are heaps of straw and scruffy brush. And in the background, you see adobe bricks. This straw is the fuel for that kiln operation. You got to ask yourself, how many karst hills have to be mowed over to produce each pile of bricks that you're looking at there? This is what they're going to use to fire the brickyard. They bring the stuff in all day long, month after month. They just have to consume just about everything that's available to them. It takes many square miles to feed this particular operation, whereas when they had the hardwood forest, they could do it with about one or two hills. <clears throat> what you're looking at, it's one of the most remarkable things I ever uh, discovered. Uh, this is a little embarrassing, but I'll tell you the whole story. I was eating in a, 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 the, their version of McDonald's. It was a little roadside restaurant, and I had to go take a leak. So I went out and back of the place, and I found this foam pole, and I leaned against that, and I started to go. And then I said, wow, look at this thing. This is a foam pole made out of a piece of absolutely perfect granite that was hand cut out of the outcrop. And then I started looking around, and I realized that this particular phone line went, we followed it for 20 miles that day. When you don't have wood, you have to go to rock. These people were so starved, they couldn't go out and cut foam poles. They went out and quarried granite and carved 20 and 30 foot long poles of granite. And they made those into their phone line. 
Here's the old and the new. The old technology are these hand-carved uh, granite blocks. You can imagine the labor that goes in to make each one. The modern is a precast concrete phone pole. Same story, just different material. You don't have any wood, that's what you do. How many of you are, re are reminded of uh, the homesteaders in Kansas that used to build fences out of uh, long pieces of rock they dug out of the sides of the hill? Same story. When you don't have wood, you do desperate things. Here's the railroad. Uh, they still have a lot of steam engines there <clears throat> because uh, they have a lot of coal in North China. But what I want you to see, not as a steam engine, they're a lot of fun, but notice what they're using for ties. There isn't a wood tie in South China. They're all made out of concrete. And then they put the concrete on a bed of uh, rock, just like we do, and they're a little rougher ride than wood, but they don't have the wood to make a railroad tie. Here are some women that are working in the uh, um, uh, boiler dump along the railroad. And uh, you have three women, the one's got the baby, you have to see these as three competing economic units. What they're doing is they're mucking through the boiler waste to come up with the unburned chunks of coal which go in the bag, and that's the prize commodity that they're gonna take home or sell. They are also going through there to get clinker. You'll see piles of clinker next to the bags over here on the right, and they can sell that too for a concrete aggregate. But the idea is, is that these people are at a level where you got to do that just to get your fuel. <clears throat> Here's an old woman who runs up every time the train pulls into the station. And uh, you got the engine on the left and the uh, tender on the right. And there's a screw that moves the coal from the tender out to the engine. They don't shovel it in. That's not the way you do it. The, uh, the coupling has a hole about an inch in diameter, and as the screw is moving the coal past the coupling, once in a while a piece of coal flies out and lands on top of the manifold over the uh, screw, and what she does is she knows that, so every time the train comes into town, she runs out there, and with that fork stick, she pulls the coal off the manifold, and it drops into her basket, and nobody takes it from her, and she takes that home, and that's her fuel. Here's one of the most incredible pictures I took in South China. You're looking at a home. These people were very gracious. I walked into their town, and uh, they invited me in. I met all the folks. About 30 people live in that house, four generations. And I snapped their picture when I left. And I got home, and I looked at that, and I said, wow. That house is pre-1958 because there isn't a tree within 50 miles of the place that you could cut a board that size from today. Here's what it looked like before they cut it. This is from the same climatic zone in Thailand. What you're looking at is a dense subtropical rainforest. It's sitting there with fabulous biodiversity. There's the same picture from South China. Look at the biodiversity here. And there we are in South China. Now, uh, why don't you give me some light and load up that second carousel, and I'll t talk to you a little bit about uh, what we're looking at here. What happened was, in 1959, <clears throat> When the program was in full force, these people had quotas for charcoal, lime, and um, um, uh, steel, and they did their best to get it. Tens of thousands of peasants went out and did the job. While they were doing that job, nobody was planting the fields. The fields were left foul. And here's the amazing thing. They are trying to satisfy Mao. Mao wants steel. Their smelters aren't producing anything that's worthwhile. So what did they do to meet their quotas? They started melting down their tools to meet the steel quotas. So when the smoke cleared, they had no crops 
and they didn't have tools to do it again. So they went into a great famine. The early data out of China was that the famine of this period took three million lives. When I first started going there, the number had finally risen to six million. The last time I heard a credible number, the real famine deaths from this one event were something on the order of 20 million people. You can take any one, in, one of those numbers. All of them are horrible. When you deal with China, always realize that the Chinese always give you the best spin. So you can take the worst number is probably the closest to the truth. It's an absolutely incredible story. Today, they've, had, uh, they've adjusted to it. Human beings adjust to stuff. They export as much population as they can. That's migrating to the cities. So the, the farmers out there don't make any money. So they get out of there. In the old days, they couldn't. Now they can. The people that stay have got a subsistence living. But realize that that subsistence living is something between two and three crop failures away from starvation. These people are walking on a knife edge. And this is something that is, that is uh, very dramatic. <clears throat> now, what I was telling you about is I went over there to this conference. I learned everything I just showed you after this and everything I just showed you after this, uh, after my first uh, uh, slide, is all outside my field. It's very interesting. It's great technical stuff. I got home and I found this story very intriguing and I published it. I published it in a journal called Groundwater. It gets pretty good distribution. It goes to uh, technical people. What I found out was this story hadn't gotten out of China. This was a news story just as much as a technical story. And the people were more interested in the news aspect of it than the technical aspect. So towards the end of my career, I started getting requests to come to different professional meetings around the world to give this story because a lot of areas are undergoing deforestation. And they want to, uh, they want to uh, forewarn their policymakers that this is a problem. And so that's what I did. And uh, I got to republish this three or four times, which is actually fantastic for an academic resume, right? But anyway, uh, th this is, a, this is a, a very interesting story. What I've done is I've thrown together uh, a handful of technical slides that I thought you might enjoy, and I'll show you those to wrap this up, and then we'll take a couple of questions. If, unless you want questions now, I can take them now. You want to see a few more slides? Okay, fire that up, and uh, let's... Okay, run those slides, and yeah, here we go. I was dealing with uh, what they call stone forest aquifers. These are shallow, unconfined aquifers. What unconfined means is, is that the water fills them up that comes out on a land surface. This is the China karst. It's absolutely gorgeous. These are the spires of limestone that are uh, left after the dissolution has proceeded. And this, is, this occurs across the whole part of the country. Now, these spires are made out of limestones. Uh, we used to use that for tombstones before they started doing granite tombstones. That stuff is impermeable. You can't get a drop of water through it if you, uh, unless you drill a hole. And there's what it looks like close up. The, the vertical dimensions on that picture are about 8 to 12 feet. So this is very dramatic. Not a place you want to parachute into. Here's what it looks like in lowlands where it's starting to get buried by uh, soils. And now what you're looking at are just the tips of those spires sticking out of the ground. And this is the character of the aquifers that we're dealing with. Here you see the spire sticking out of the ground a little bit. They stick up about two feet. But uh, the soils are about 15 or 15, 20 feet deep between the little spires here. Now, what happens is we rain on that, and the soils fill up with water. And so the soils are the permeable matrix of my aquifer, and the uh, spires are an impermeable matrix that holds it together. This is the class of aquifers I want. And, uh, or I'm dealing with, and now what we want to do is exploit water from this. 
Here's a typical karst plane. You can see it's been uh, farmed for decades, for eons. Just a few feet below the surface is that same stuff, those spires filled in with sediments. And they, uh, it's all barely covered up. And if you don't believe me, here's another one. This is one of the flat areas in the hill. Same story. Underneath us here are these spires with soil and filling them, and it's level. If you don't believe me, here's a guy out in the middle of that uh, first field I showed you, and here you see the very tops of one of the spires just sticking through the soil. Okay, now what we want to do is get down into that and exploit the water that's in the soils or in the, uh, the uh, regolith, they call it. Okay, now uh, if we take a look at these things, uh, I've already discussed this, the carbonate rocks are, are a structural framework and the infilling sediments are the porous media that we're going to get our water from. And the characteristics of this stuff is that, that these aquifers are thin, most of them less than 20 or 30 feet thick, but 30 meters at the most. They have large lateral permeabilities, which means the water moves laterally in and out of this place readily, but it doesn't go vertically because there's nowhere for it to go. The worst part is, is that these things have very small storage because they're thin. So these are very uh, delicate or temperamental aquifers. I'll show you how they develop groundwater from these things. Here's a drill rig. This thing is a diesel rotary rig, just the same as the one that you see them drilling out, uh, out in the plains here. Uh, and uh, it, this thing is, uh, this little machine here is capable of drilling a hole up to about uh, 150 to 200 feet deep with no problem. And this machine here is a diesel driven mud pump which circulates the fluid down the pipe to wash the cuttings out. And uh, we found this stuff laying around out there. Notice that it's not connected up, all the hoses are cut and everything like that. They can't use it. They can't use these machines because they take diesel fuel to operate and they can't afford to put the diesel fuel in them. So they have to go to another technology. Here's the technology. They send swarms of people out there. They can hire these people for, at the time I was there, for six for a dollar a day. Okay? So you get six people for a dollar a day. And what they do is they start digging a hole out in the middle of the plains in a low spot. And they uncover those stone spires like you see here. And once they uncover the stone spires, they look for the biggest openings and they start to tunnel down into those openings. And they dig down to the water table, which you can just see above those three bottom guys there. What you're looking at here, if you're a geologist or a petroleum geologist, this is the mud removal system. This is how they get the mud out. You have a chain of women that you pass the buckets up to. And they take it out to some dump somewhere. Here they've intersected the water table and they dig down as deep as they can and they hope that this will be a reliable water supply during the uh, uh, dry season. They've got pumps in there to pump test it to see how their production is. When they get done, they whirl up the soils and against the rock spires to give the well a stable feature. And now you have a communal well there. You build a stairway down to it so that you can get down there to uh, uh, get your water. Uh, this is South China. These people aren't real sophisticated. They're going to drive their water buffalo right down those stairs and let them wallow in the water too. But anyway, everybody gets a drink. And then at the top of this thing, about where that woman in the white shirt is standing, they're going to put up a monument. And on the monument will be the name of everybody that was involved in the project and what they were paid. If they don't get enough water in one location to supply the demand they want, they just start digging laterally until they get enough. So here's a long well. And if you look at the top there, there's a, what looks like a concrete bunker. 
that's, uh, that's the top of a conduit, uh, uh, an irrigation ditch that they fill with this thing. This is uh, Chinese uh, uh, irrigation technology. They've gotten the water into a ditch. Now it's flowing out into the fields. And that guy that's on the uh, left side there has got a, a little uh, scoop that's mounted on that A-frame. And he sits there for 10 to 12 hours a day and scoops water into the lateral ditch going off to the uh, right. Here's the uh, preferred means. <clears throat> Two girls, probably about 12, 13 years old, they string this bucket between them, and for 12 hours a day, they pump the water out of the main ditch into the laterals and irrigate the fields. The primary purpose of having uh, girls in China is to move water, at least in this area. And here's where you find the guys. Now here's one uh, thing I thought you might find interesting. I was looking at an awful lot of caves down there because I'm interested in caves and they're one of the things I went over there to see. And when we got into South China, I started finding these caves that had these pots in them. They, that was great. And uh, I started to look around and I saw a lot of them. And uh, what you notice is there's a pot there with a piece of paper on it with a rock on top. And that got to be something we started running into all the time. Here's another one of these things. These caves were filled with these pots, and I was absolutely intrigued with these things. I thought they were storing grain or something in them. Turns out these are their burial urns. And uh, the, we were in, uh, we in an area that was uh, populated by what they call their minority people. It would be like uh, me going down to the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. These are not uh, uh, Chinese. These are minorities that live in South China, and uh, their custom when they die is to be laid to rest on a, a field and they cover them up with about six inches of dirt. And then they let the body decay. And as the body decays, the spirit leaves and goes off to the heavens and what's left are the bones. Then what they do is they go back in about a year, year and a half and they rake the mound and they rake the bones out and they put the bones in a pot and the pot goes into temporary storage in one of these caves. It's an intermediate step in the funerary process. And then after uh, several years, maybe a decade, then they find a scenic spot, and then they take the pot out and put the bones in the scenic spot so the person has a final resting place. So the little, um, the little tufts of paper you see on the top tells you who's in the pot. And as you see in this picture, we got baby pots and we got full size pots. Okay. Now I can take any questions you might have. Were you serious that that's what the men are doing? Yes. I was going to ask, what are the men doing while the women are pumping water? The women in South China work like slaves. You gotta be kidding. Get out of here. No, that's why we have women. It's amazing, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. Most of the pictures I'm showing you were from my 1990 visit there. Some of them from the 88 visit. That's when I really got the meat out of this thing. Yeah, there have been radical changes since then. Um, the economic, uh, the, the east coast of China has become a boom area, as you know. We've got a lot of factories over there. And there's been mass migrations of the young people out of these villages to those communities where they can make some kind of money. And uh, the, the living conditions in those, uh, those factory towns are absolutely horrendous. I mean, they're just, they're packed in there like sushi, and uh, they're, they're working, um, uh, 50 and 60 hour weeks, you know, things like that. It's not a good life, but it's better than this for sure. So this area is starting to depopulate a little bit. The other thing that's happened with the economic boom in China is the regulations have been relaxed so that there aren't government officials out there 
doing two things, enforcing the one child per family rule, and the other thing is uh, keeping the peasants out of the woods. So what's happened since I've been there is that hundreds of little mom and pop sawmills have gone in and they're now cutting down the regrowth and turning it into sticks that they use to build the buildings in southeast China. So the place is getting hammered again. You know, it's a very interesting story. It's a wonderful story. What we're looking at is by deforesting this area, they've permanently impoverished something on the order of 100 million people. And there isn't a ticket out. No, they don't burn too much here, uh, but I know the story you're talking about in Brazil. That keeps the forest from coming back. It's really bad. Another interesting place to go to see modern deforestation is uh, Venezuela. Venezuela is fantastic. <laughs> if you go to Venezuela and you go to Maracaibo, which is the oil city in Venezuela, so you geologists will get there someday, uh, <clears throat> what they've gotten in Venezuela are goats that were introduced by the Spanish and the goats are eating their way south. And they've eaten their way about 120 miles from the coast, and they've arrived in the jungle. And when you fly over it, and you look down, there's a line. And where you see the line, you just see these goats like army ants. And behind the line, there is nothing but red soil. And there isn't anything green that is below the height that a goat can reach. So, if a plant regenerates, it gets eaten before it sprouts. Utterly hopeless. Is this a problem in North America? Yes. Exactly the same thing is happening in the scenic Copper Canyon in Mexico. Have any of you visited that as a tourist? You take the railroad from Chihuahua over to Topolobampo. You stop and you look in Copper Canyon. It's as big as the Grand Canyon. That entire thing has now been eaten off by goats and they're spilling out of the canyon and starting to move over the plateaus, which have been eaten out by feral horses and donkeys. Americans are all hyped about the immigration problem. Those people are leaving Mexico because they've destroyed their environment. They've got no choice. They have my greatest sympathy. I'm not worrying about immigrant Mexican nationals coming across the border. I'm sweating out when the goats arrive. <laughs> they're only 120 miles south, and they're coming. Well, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.